Greetings, Pearl citizens. It is I, your fearless leader of Austin, Texas, Pearlmongers, Will the Chill, coming to you live on June 10th, 2021 with the Pearl Conference in the cloud. Thank you everyone for joining me. Uh, we are broadcasting to you today live from the Pearl capital of the world, according to yours truly, Austin, Texas. And today we will be talking about machine learning in pure Pearl. So um, I will have to, uh, I am once again coming to you to ask your forgiveness in advance because this will once again be a meme-tastic presentation. So I hope you like memes related to machine learning. I know I do. <laughs> Next slide, please. So why machine learning? Why or what is machine learning? Why do we care about machine learning? Um, why have I spent my time to make a presentation in a bunch of Perl software about machine learning? Good question, Will. Thanks, Will. I'll answer the question now. Well, as you can see in this hilarious meme, which I did not make, um, I actually I didn't have to make any of the memes this time pretty much because there was already a ton of memes about machine learning. Unlike that other presentation, which is only number one so far, last time I checked, in which case I had to make all of the Pearl memes myself. But anyway, you can see this guy here, he's got something. In this case, it's actually a defect in his structural integrity of the wall here. But uh, this crack in the wall is labeled statistics. He puts a frame around it and, and declares that it is machine learning and then goes on further to declare that is artificial intelligence. So what is the difference between these three things? Well, it depends on who you ask and where you draw the somewhat arbitrary lines in the sand. <sighs> so I guess if we were going to build on some neat old saying, uh, sufficiently advanced statistics are indistinguishable from machine learning and sufficiently advanced machine learning is indistinguishable from artificial intelligence. Um, although I guess in order of mm, popular uh, uh, surgeons in the, in the academic and, and business communities, it was pretty much statistics first. That's like old fashioned math. Uh, then AI was real big until we realized that it was way harder than we thought. And then we just kind of started focusing on this thing more recently called machine learning. Machine learning is, According again to yours truly, the presenter in this case, uh, we can consider machine learning to be like a, a subset of the of the uh, overall technologies that would be required to build an artificial intelligence. Um, and we could then uh, again consider statistics to be a significant uh, component that goes into building machine learning. So each one is building on top of the next to hear me describe it at least. Again, if you ask 100 different computer scientists what the difference between those three things are, you will get 110 different answers because some of them are going to hedge their bets and give multiple conflicting answers. <sighs> but more importantly, why do we care about machine learning nowadays, right now for business reasons? Well, gosh dang, there's a lot of money, 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 filthy lucre. Greenback, simoleons, Texas tea. Oh, wait, no, that's something else that converts to money. But, you know, the point is that uh, there's a lot of money that's just being dumped. I mean, like, by the truck load, by the tanker load of money just being dumped by corporations into machine learning. So if you want a job you uh, in, in computer programming nowadays, if you put machine learning on your resume, it's probably going to help you. Uh, the, I guess you could also say there's big results. I put scare quotes around big in this case, because it again, depends on who you ask, but I do believe that the results that you can get from properly utilized machine learning can be big results that it can achieve things that would be prohibitively difficult to do otherwise. Um, and there are, again, depending on who you ask, there's usually quoted as three different main categories or types of, of, um, machine learning algorithms or approaches, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement. Supervised learning is where you already have uh, sample data or like input data that's somehow categorized or that you know is correct in some way. Um, and then the machine learns off of that, the algorithm learns off of that correct data and goes on to try and 
do other stuff, whatever that may be. Uh, classifying things or making decisions about things or whatever. Um, in unsupervised learning, you do not already have a set of data that you know is correct or classified or somehow sorted or organized. You're just saying, go figure it out on your own. And the algorithm will have to figure out what the classifications may be and so forth. And that's perhaps even more difficult. And reinforcement learning is, is uh, more of a feedback loop, I guess, or a dynamic interaction between the, um, the learning algorithm and its environment. Somebody is unmuted. So whoever the host is, can you mute everyone except for me, please? Uh, and please check if you're muted because I'm hearing some background noise from someone else. Thank you. It's fixed. Um, the reinforcement uh, type of learning is basically like uh, you're giving rewards when the algorithm does the correct thing um, and the, the algorithm is trying to maximize its rewards. So that's reinforcement learning. I remember reinforcement learning came out real big when I was in college and here we are still trying to figure it all out. But why Pure Pearl? Well, this is a machine learning and Pure Pearl presentation. Because it defines who I am. Oh wait, that was someone who never talks about, never stops talking about machine learning. Well, I guess if I I know some people that never stop talking about machine learning and Pearl, and that's great. Um, we need more of that actually. Um, probably because of this whole big money thing that I was mentioning, and also I guess I should foreshadow a conclusion about um, why machine learning is important. It's because it's kind of like the future of of programming in many ways. It, machine learning will never like probably decrease. It's going to keep increasing in importance um, and prevalence and, and significance and the as a required skill for people to get um, programming jobs and do projects competitively with other groups and companies and so forth. So uh, machine learning is kind of the future. It's a big part of the future of, of software development. So why do we care about doing this in Pure Pearl? Well, I do not like writing code in excess. Um, maybe you do if you're like crazy or again, masochistic person. Um, I, same thing for C. I'm not a huge fan. I'd rather use C than XS, but still would rather not use it if I don't have to. And, and obviously Perl, we like to think is better than Python. I think that everyone watching this would hopefully agree that we would prefer to use Perl rather than Python if we had the option, right? So Where's the option? Other, we're getting to that obviously. Other, other reasons why we care about doing things in pure Perl. Um, readability, I mean, I, especially compared to like XS or C, the readability of pure Perl is gonna be far, far higher. Compared to other dynamic or high level languages like Python, it could be relatively similar with just ugly white space or syntax sugar or whatever, depending on your preference, right? It's more about preference at that point. Um, but certainly Perl is going to have much better readability than a lower level language. Um, and if you write really great Perl code, it could have really great readability. Maintainability, similarly, I uh, do not want to try and um, maintain anyone else's excess code ever. I've had to tweak a few things here and there. And holy cow, it was like, you know, crawling under an old house and trying to fix the plumbing and you could just die at any moment sort of thing. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, but yeah, maintainability. And I would much rather maintain someone's Perl code rather than non-Perl code. Um, why do you keep mentioning that snake language? I don't know. We'll get there in a minute, I guess. Um, performance. Wow. Most people wouldn't say that they're using Perl for performance unless they're in the ignorant group of people who think that Perl runs really fast compared to other modern languages. When I'm here to dispel that wildly incorrect rumor that with the um, sole exception of isolating special cases like regex only timings, um, the, the general uh, speed of the Perl interpreter is uh, slower than Java, slower than JavaScript, slower than Python, slower than Ruby. Perl is not a particularly fast interpreter, um, but we can, we can get around that as we'll see here in a moment by using pure Perl, next slide, please. Uh, Perl versus Python, the snake language, as I call it, the snake coming on up through the bushes to get you. Well, 
there's a lot going on in Python for machine learning, so much that I had to make an entire slide about it here, and that there is, in fact, uh, a meme about that. So um, here you see some dude reading some giant manual on some arcane computer system, presumably. Um, and then you see some nicely manicured ladies' fingers with a tiny book. Um, and in this particular uh, titling or, or context, the, uh, the guy with the huge manual is the person that wrote all the math or uh, is uh, studying the math, right, for the statistics. Th that's the stats, right? We saw the picture frame and the crack in the wall. That's the math, the statistics. Um, but once that's written, right, once the code is written and working, all you have to do is just put one line of code, you know, to import that library. And, and that would be like an include statement in C or an import statement or in the snaky snake language or the uh, use statement in Perl. It's just importing some library and then you just, you're, you're up and running. You're off to the races with one line. You now have this giant book of, of, of math um, and algorithms at your fingertip. Well, in Python, that is very much the case. Um, you can see here uh, just the top six um, Python packages relating to machine learning, each of which has dozens or hundreds of, of algorithms implemented in them. So there's, there's thousands of, of, you know, bits of usable code uh, among these, these top six here. Um, so I, I'm not going to try and get into any of them. You've probably heard about them all. I am not a Python user. I don't use Python or write Python code, obviously. Um, but I have had to look at some Python code for two reasons, I guess. Number one, to see what these things looked like, what the code looked like. Was it well-written? Is it a mess? Is it hard to understand? Is it um, well-documented and so forth? And also, in a much more specific and smaller capacity to try and see if it was possible to understand or copy any of their algorithms because the algorithms are generic, you know, machine learning algorithms that are in my old computer science textbooks. But I was like, well, if somebody's gone to the trouble of actually trying to code it up, maybe I can look at their code. I've done it a few times with simple algorithms in the past. Usually with more complex situations you need to just read the textbook and understand how it works and then code the whole thing from scratch but i wanted to see i wanted to see if i could you know snag any algorithms for free uh, or for a discount price uh, you know a, a less steep learning curve and i did open up scikit-learn uh, the first one on the list here called sklearn for short and um i was eventually able to dig down deep enough in their code to actually find like a piece of an algorithm but gosh dang it was buried so deep and with such obscure inputs and outputs that it was not usable in the sense really of like well i can just see how this algorithm works and code it right up in pure pearl not really i mostly had to study the algorithm with some friends who all thank at the end of the presentation and um, and understand how it worked and, and try and just kind of sort of code it from scratch. Um, I guess if you want to uh, extend this visual analogy of the guy with the huge book and the lady with the tiny book, um, well, you may be asking yourself, what the name of this slide, it says right across the top, machine learning, Perl versus Python, but all six of these are appear to be Python. Where's the Perl? I'll ask again, where's the pearl on this list? Crickets. You're going to get crickets. Get it? It's not a good joke. It's not a funny joke, but it's true. There's just not much, by the way, of pearl in machine learning. So again, to visually, to extend this visual analogy, Python is at least this giant fat book and Perl is at most this tiny thin little thing. 
Um, Perl has an interface to the fast artificial neural networks. Perl has some interfaces. Other some clever Perl programmer who thinks he or she is doing a good thing may even be implementing or have already implemented some Perl interfaces to these Python libraries, thinking that's a good thing. But gosh dang, do we want our Perl machine learning to just be a wrapper around Python? No. In fact, I will say, heck gosh, baby dang, no. We do not. That's that would be that would be very depressing, very bad. We'd never be able to advertise that Perl has its own machine learning code because it would all be just wrappers around Python. And uh, this is the same problem that much of BioPerl suffers from because it, much of BioPerl is a wrapper around BioC. But and there's no such thing as BioC, but it's the C code libraries. Thank goodness. Though that's not a bunch of Python libraries, so it's a little bit less disingenuous to use the term BioPerl, but we could not apply the term machine learning Perl or ML Perl, as we're calling it, to, uh, to something that's just a bunch of Python wrappers. That, that would be no good. So we need to do it ourselves. Next slide, please. Okay, here is what we have been working on. There's an algorithm called K nearest neighbors, and I'm going to show you. Oh my goodness. Why can't we mute people and force them to stay muted? Well, thank you, Zoom. And again, whoever is the administrator of this Zoom call, let's go ahead and try and control that issue. Please do not unmute yourselves during a public presentation. Uh, in the K-nearest neighbors algorithm, um, I'm just going to visually explain it instead of trying to show you pseudocode and walk you through my learning process. There, uh, this is our sample data. So this is the data that we know is correct. In this very simple case, it's two-dimensional K nearest neighbor. So the points are two-dimensional data. It makes it easy to show on a two-dimensional screen. Uh, there are two groups of data, a red square and a blue circle. The blue circle is just called group A and the red square is called group B. They could be any classification. It could be men or women. It could be up and down. It could be right or left, good or bad. It could be, you know, cheap, expensive, whatever these two different groups may be. It could be two different types of things or plants or animals or whatever. It's just two different groups that are not one group. They are definitely two different groups. You could have as many groups as you want, but we're doing like the simplest possible example. So you can understand here. You can see that these groups are mostly centered around the origins, like the vertical axis around the zero origin is where the blue group is. And the, uh, the horizontal axis around the zero origin, again, is where most of the red group is clustered. And they're kind of spread out and distributed among those uh, different axes uh, on this graph. So uh, we feed this data into the K nearest neighbors algorithm, and it will learn. This is its supervised learning period, is it learns what this data classification is. Next step is we give it some test data. Here you can see the test data. This test data is literally just random, randomly generated. It's, it's a random number generator that generated random data within this window of, of range of values. Um, and it's uh, really not clustered in any way. It's, it's actually totally random, or at least as pseudo random as we can get on a, a random number generator on a computer. Um, it's still obviously two dimensional points within the same you know, dimensionality and, and uh, the space, uh, test space here. There's no grouping assigned at this point. These, these data points have no, no classification, no categorization, no grouping applied to them. Um, and again, it's totally random distribution at this time. So what's gonna happen is that the algorithm, K nearest neighbors is going to, for each one of these points, it's going to go back to the original sample data and find the nearest neighbors. K is an arbitrary integer. You could set K to two or three or four or five, and it would pick the top, you know, if you set K equal to three, then it would pick the three closest neighbors. So if we're looking at um, this data point right here, I don't even know if you guys can see my um, cursor, but if you can't, it's not the very tip top one, but it's the one 
under that sort of in the middle of the top. Uh, the, the nearest neighbors to that would be all blue because it would be this cluster of three blue dots that's uh, all kind of close to each other. It just randomly happens to be quite close, but uh, nevertheless, those would be the three nearest neighbors of this particular data point. So um, depending on the distance function you use, which we'll talk about in a minute, it would almost certainly determine that those three uh, blue points are the three nearest neighbors if you set k to three to this currently uncategorized test data point. And thus the algorithm would determine that that point is blue. And you can see here in the now categorized data, that point has turned blue and the rest of the points have similarly been iterated through and, and categorized according to their K nearest neighbors. And interestingly, you can see now that there is a similar distribution to the sample data points. Um, the, the data points that are more clustered along the vertical are blue and the data points that are more clustered around the horizontal are the red squares. So the blue circles and the red squares are, you know, uh, similarly distributed. Now there's no way to be perfect and there's many different options and weighting functions, distance functions we'll talk about in a minute. But using a simple example, this is what you end up with. And this needs to be a simple example so we can just visually understand how this works because it's a bunch of tedious code to write it all out. Speaking of tedious code, let's check it out. Uh, sorry for so many slides without memes. Gosh, dang. Somebody needs to make a meme about not enough memes, I guess. But um, here we have uh, a snippet of code. This is actually just a, a, a nearly empty um, Perl class that we created called a uh, neighbor 2D. And um, for each two dimensional neighbor, uh, we don't really have any uh, methods, no operations applied here. It's just data properties. Um, there's a property that's actually called data. Um, and this is the actual two dimensional data point, you know, the X and Y coordinates, if you're looking at the graph, uh, the distance, is how far it is from its neighbor. And uh, the classification is which group was it put in? Was it put in group A or B? Uh, and, and so was it, was it again gonna be like the, the blue or the red group? So those are the two classifications. Um, this all starts out as empty or undefined sort of data, um, but you can see we are using data types and this is critical because uh, we want our code to run fast in the end. So um, the two-dimensional data is a, a number array ref. Um, and in the new composing version, it would be number uh, colon colon uh, array ref. So it'd be number scope array ref instead of underscore. Um, you can see this number two is actually a hint uh, that says it's gonna be a two-dimensional data, but you don't have to put that if you don't know the size of the data. Um, the distance is an individual number. So that's a floating point number. And the classification is a string um, because it could be anything. You could it could be named, you know, llamas versus emus, or camels versus dromedaries, or you know, pearl versus non-pearl, whatever. It it's just a string. It, it's an arbitrary string classification. That's it. That's the whole class. That's all you really need, as far as we're, we're implementing this in a somewhat object-oriented fashion, uh, because it it makes sense to have these neighbors as their sort of standalone objects. Um, we could crunch this all into some giant data structure or something, but why make bad code when you can make nicer code? And this, this is a programming exercise that does lend itself to object-oriented stylings. So uh, what do we do with this? Next slide. We use it in um, the classifier function. So um, this is, again, the interesting part of the code. There's a whole bunch of boilerplate that has to do with data inputs and outputs and, and so forth. Um, but this is the cool part of the code. The code, uh, there's some before and after it that has to do with uh, finding out which of the distances are the shortest and iterating through data and so forth. But this is the math. This is the math that we care about, um, the math behind 
the uh, K nearest neighbor. So that's why I chose these bits to look at specifically. This is three different distance functions. By the way, K nearest neighbor is a supervised uh, type of machine learning algorithm. Um, you, I guess there might be some way to do it as reinforcement or unsupervised. I haven't gone that deep, um, but this style of using the default of using K nearest neighbor is um, supervised learning. And uh, within the sort of, I guess, subclassification of, of uh, supervised learning is um, classifiers. There's also regression. There's also other things, like I mentioned, uh, making decisions about things and, and so forth. Um, uh, usually, uh, active learning classification and regression are quoted as some of the primary subcategories of, of supervised learning. Um, so we're, we're classifying in this case. That means that we want to choose a classification for each of those points that did not have a classification. So um, how, how do we know which of the neighbors is nearest? Well, we have to calculate the distance and then just choose the, the top K uh, closest neighbors or K nearest neighbors. That's the name of the algorithm. Um, but uh, in this case, we, we don't know how to compute the distance because there's several different ways. I mean, you could, you could make up any distance function. In fact, uh, there, there are not only these three sort of obvious and easy distance functions that we're about to cover real quick, but there are, um, you could make up your own distance functions. Functions. There's a ton of different um, op, uh, options and, and uh, you know, things you can tweak and make it run a little different or a little faster or more optimized or there's, K nearest neighbor is a simple algorithm, but it can go, it can become deep. And, and that's kind of what they've done with Sklearn is they've, you know, implemented every possible option um, that you can get, including all the different distance functions, all the different uh, uh, types of input and output data and, and so forth. So, um, but let's look at these three and just see kind of how they work. The first one is called the Manhattan distance. It's called Manhattan because if you imagine that you are walking around on foot in Manhattan, um, it's a bunch of city grids, right? It's a, it's a square city with all of these, uh, you know, city blocks in a grid. And um, you cannot cut diagonal through a building, obviously, because that's a solid brick building that you as a, you know, matter-based entity cannot pass through. Maybe if you were a non-corporeal form, you could float right through the, the big giant buildings. But as a normal human, you have to walk, you know, three blocks north and then two blocks east to get to a place that as the crow flies diagonal would be a much shorter distance. Um, so it, it actually does take quite a long time to walk anywhere in Manhattan. Um, I, I've been on several field trips as a youth uh, uh, living in the, in the Northeast and um, you just kind of walk forever. Those city blocks are, are super long. So the Manhattan distance, as you can see here, is just the, uh, the X distance um, so, you know, the, uh, the training data minus the test data, X coordinates, uh, plus the training data, um, minus test data, Y coordinates. So it's the same thing of just walking up and then walking over. It's not a diagonal shortcut. It's, it's a longer distance because it's like city blocks walking there. Uh, that's called the Manhattan distance. Um, there may be reasons to use this. It's, uh, I guess, whatever makes sense to you uh, to do that. There's, there's no right or wrong answer, really. The second um, metric or distance function is Euclidean. And this is, uh, this is where you can go diagonal. You can go as the crow flies or imagine you're, you know, in no clipping mode in Doom and um, you can, you know, uh, IDSP, ISPOPD, right through the diagonal through the walls and, and get to where you need to go in a shorter distance, obviously. 
Um, and this is um, perhaps more meaningful for two-dimensional type data that has two-dimensional distances um, because it's the obvious natural distance between two points would be to just go directly between them instead of walking down and then over. Um, in order to do that, you have to, you have to uh, subtract the x coordinates, but then square that, subtract the y coordinates, square that, add them together, and then take the square root of the whole thing. Um, you probably remember this from your geometry um, in high school or, or college. So that is the normal 2D method. Um, if we had to keep one of these three, we would keep Euclidean for two-dimensional because it's, um, it's the fastest implementation of the default most natural distance for two-dimensional data points. Um, and then the third metric that we can see here, this is all pure parole, obviously. This is the real code. I just copied and pasted it. Um, this is Minkowski space. So Euclidean space is sort of the normal two-dimensional distance. Minkowski is uh, generalized. Um, in fact, Minkowski is the generalized version of both Manhattan and Euclidean. Once you understand that, conversely, um, Euclidean and Manhattan are degenerate cases of Minkowski. So Minkowski space um, is the same thing as Euclidean, but instead of squaring it, squaring it, and square rooting it, you're doing um, an arbitrary power, arbitrary power, and then that same thing as the um, power root. So one over that, uh, which is the same thing as taking the square root. If the P power was two, um, then you would be squaring it, squaring it, taking the square root. So um, you can see that with P equal to Minkowski space is equal to Euclidean. Um, Minkowski distance, sorry, is equal to Euclidean. And then with P equal one, Minkowski distance is equivalent to Manhattan because you're just raising things to the first power, raise it to the first power, and then take the first root of it, the one root, which is nothing. It all is just a no op. And thus it can drop out and, and become this more simple code that you see right here. Um, Minkowski distance is more complicated, more computationally intensive. So um, you probably don't want to use that unless you have to use it for some weird scientific reason. But if you have multidimensional data, then it's going to become, I believe, much more significant. So um, this is real code. Uh, above and around this code, there's like um, a for loop to go through each point. So this is just for one data point. And then after this piece of this code, it does have to have another for loop to search for those k nearest neighbors because it's this is calculating one distance for one neighbor, but then you have to do that for the k nearest neighbors and then throw out the ones that are not the nearest neighbors and so forth. So there's a lot of optimization that can go on in this algorithm. That's why I'm not going to try and go through um, every bit of the code during this presentation. You can look it up yourself if you like. Next slide, please. Oh my goodness, we're still in the middle of this long run with no memes. That's a very bad mistake on my part. I should have interjected some Perl memes in the middle of this code. Um, let's go back to one that had some memes. Oh yes, the guy with the giant book. That was cool. Okay, back to this stuff. Um, run times in Python. Oh, get that language out of here. Well, um, yeah, the snake language, the snake language matters a lot uh, because we need to know how we're doing, I guess. Are we doing good or not? Um, so I just used Sklern. I, um, my, my friends helped me. Uh, well, my friends actually used Sklern and I just kind of copied their code. But, um, but yeah, this is actual Sklern runtimes on my system. Um, obviously, it's an arbitrary speed because my computer speed will be different than yours, but all of these runtimes were done on the same system. So that's what matters. Uh, sorry, I didn't sort this by data size, but it's kind of in these groups of, of uh, three rows at a time. Um, for the number of timing repetitions. I kept increasing the timing repetitions because 
with a low number of, of repetitions, you were having too much startup and shutdown time and things weren't getting cached right. And it's not as accurate of a timing, I guess. Um, so with more repetitions, it helps. And then of course, increasing the data size um, of the training data and increasing the, the data size of the testing data. So all of these things kind of multiply out to make larger and larger data. And um, in general, longer and longer run times, although I didn't sort this by, again, data size or runtime, um, I apologize in that, but we'll see the data sorted here in a minute. Uh, I, I did this the way that it was in my, my timing spreadsheet. Uh, and then you can see the, this is a speed column. This, uh, this column here um, is, is essentially a, a measure of speed. Uh, and you can see that that is, um, slowly increasing in speed. So the, the bigger the test data and the longer you let the Python code run, the faster it runs, interestingly. Um, and uh, it, it in fact, uh, continues to run faster and faster. That, that was an annoying thing. I will tell you that the Python interpreter um, has so much tricky stuff built into it. I had to do operating, operating system level uh, sandboxing and process control in order to stop the Python interpreter from um, spawning new threads, from caching things that it shouldn't, and so forth, in order to make it show me a real timing. Um, the, Python did not want to show me a real timing, let's just say that. Now, I'm sure for the Python programmers that just want something to run and run fast, that's great, but when you're doing comparative timings, it was not so easy or great. We're going to come back to the slide in a minute, but let's look at Perl. It's the same exact um, sizes and, and timing repetitions and so forth. Um, and you can see that it is again increasing in speed. The second to last column here, um, it is slowly increasing in speed, um, although perhaps not as much as we would like. So if we go back to the previous slide, you will see that the last column in both of them is comparative. So for the Python speeds, where the last column is the Perl comparative speed up. How many times faster is Python than Perl? So, uh, and then for the, for the Perl slide, it's the opposite. So uh, at the very small, smallest scale, Python was like one and two thirds the speed. If this was one, it would mean they're equal speed. But once you get up into you know larger run times um, and sizes, data size, and so forth, uh, Python starts getting a lot faster. And this was even with all of my controls turned on. With the controls not turned on, Python became way too fast, way too quick. But it was doing all sorts of cheats and and stuff that was not real timings again. So it, it was not comparative. It was apples to oranges, not apples to apples. So when you do the apples to apples comparison as close as I could possibly get it, this is what you get. Um, eventually, uh, Python keeps getting faster and faster and Perl can't keep up with that. Um, I, th this, the data that you're looking at here shows it going um, all the way up to 19 times faster, Python 19 times faster than Perl. Um, but I can tell you it keeps going. It does not end there. Um, in fact, I'm looking at, at my much larger spreadsheet that has sparse data. Um, when I stopped running the Perl code, because it was taking like, it was going to take over a day to run, um, Python was 30 times faster. And, and still increasing. So for long running data, like, you know, real uh, machine learning stuff that's going to run for days and days and weeks and weeks, Python could be 50 times, 100 times fast. It's so much more faster, even with full controls locking it down, that Perl can't really compete. When you turn those controls off, Python's going to be 500 times faster or 1,000 times faster or something that's so much faster that uh, right about now, y'all should start getting worried if you're a Perl programmer. If you're a Python programmer here watching this for some reason, you should be laughing right about now. 
Well, don't you worry, the tides are soon about to turn here. So um, again, you can see the same thing here, uh, but it's just the, the inverted number. So it's down to about 1 20th here at the end, but it, it keeps decreasing. But wait, sir. Wasn't there some sort of thing that allows us to make our Perl code run at a competitive speed? Well, I think there is. And I seem to remember spending the last several years programming up the Perl compiler. So let's see what happens when we compile that code we looked at a few minutes ago. Well, holy cow, it starts running gosh dang fast. And not just a little fast, but really super duper 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 fast. Um, so here we have two final columns. How many times faster is compiled Perl than not compiled Perl? And how many times faster is compiled Perl than Python? And um, so now we're becoming competitive. Uh, the rate at which the compiled Perl increases in speed as data size and runtime increase is um, greater than that which interpreted Perl does. In other words, this ratio is increasing. Compiled Perl just keeps getting faster. Regular Perl is not getting fast like that. So the, this is not the, the case where, oh, I just need to run my data long enough and the Perl interpreter will eventually save me. No, 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 no. The longer you run, the worse the interpreter gets. So I'm, I'm not here to poo-poo on P5P. I'm not here to say that Perl sucks. In fact, I'm here to, to make people understand that there's better Perl to be had out there. You do not need to use the interpreter if it's going to run slow, which it will. You need to compile your Perl. Likewise, um, compiled Perl has a comparison with Python, but it's not increasing. In fact, it is converging. If you let the compiled Perl run for a long, long time, Python will apparently either completely cache all operations or internally compile everything using either our Python or some other internal jitting mechanism that I'm not familiar with. I don't know which because I'm not a Python programmer and I don't know anything about Python guts, but I can tell you that when I let the code run for a long, long time, this column that's comparing the compiled Perl with Python that will eventually converge to one. That's interesting. That's more than interesting, it may even be a little bit mind blowing because it means that the fastest we can possibly get, which is compiling our Perl code into C and C++ and is about the fastest as you can get, is also attained now apparently automatically by Python over time. It has to run for quite some time to achieve that, but it's doing, it's compiling stuff in the background or something. I don't know how it's doing that. So this is just a warning to the Perl Steering Council that as soon as you guys have an official request for comments, we're going to have to do something about getting data types into the Perl core and eventually about getting compiler, the Perl compiler, our Perl, merged into the Perl core because apparently it's already been done in Python. Whatever mechanism they're using, it's it's eventually, after a long, long time, after several hours of running, it is able to match our top speed. Now, our top speed is from the get-go. Um, that's why we start out at 17, 18, 19 times faster, because our code runs super fast from the very beginning once you just compile it. But the Python code keeps getting faster and faster. <sighs> We're getting near the end, but there's some nifty graphs. Um, this is uh, runtime. You don't want to be going up in this graph and look at Perl going up like a bottle rocket. Dang, that's interpreted Perl. 
Python is down there at the bottom, kind of munging around and slowly going up a bit. And our Perl, uh, compiled Perl, is like almost flat on the bottom there. Um, getting rid of the la first and last three entries, just zooming in a bit here, you can see that, again, regular Perl is, is going upwards at an seemingly exponentially increasing curve. I had to stop after a while because it very quickly just starts taking days to run things. I think it is increasing, maybe not exponentially, but with it could, I think it is exponentially. It's with some kind of curve upwards. Um, Python is kind of jumping around a bit and increasing a little bit, but not really. Again, it's holding pretty steady down there low because of some internal optimizations that it's doing. Um, and our fully optimized and compiled R Perl code is hugging the bottom where it should be. You can't get any lower than that. We are as fast as you can get. It's just that we were, you have to do that extra step of manually compiling the code instead of Python, which again, apparently does it automatically. Good for them. This is another situation where we're going to have to copy their homework because they're beating the pants off of us. Another graph, just one more. Um, this is the speeds. Remember, the, it's not. It's kind of the opposite of the um, runtime. The, the lower the runtime, the higher the speed, right? So you can see that uh, R Perl and um, Python uh, are jumping around a little bit on their speeds. This is. I guess because um, the their the operating system is is fluctuating just enough to to show up here, but if we average these out, it's it's a pretty straight line. The average is right, even though they seem to jump around a bit. And uh, Perl is an incredibly smooth line with an incredibly low speed. In fact, it's it's almost at the bottom, it's so low because of these uh, uh, scientific notations of, of the speed here. I should have normalized it somehow, but the point is Perl is like so slow, it's not even, not even competing, not even competitive. Thank goodness for the Perl compiler. Next slide, coming upgrades. I've got three minutes, two and a half minutes. Um, we need to implement maybe some more distance functions I guess, for more generic cases. Um, other classification algorithms, start getting some regression algorithms in there. Um, part of the data type overhaul that we're currently in the process of for the Perl compiler is um, to add C++ template support that allows us some really powerful multidimensional data structure stuff, um, which is kind of key to um, a lot of uh, machine learning because data points rarely are only two dimensional or even three dimensional. You have n dimensional data points and you have to be able to do nearest neighbors and lots of other learning algorithms using n dimensional data, arbitrary dimensional data. Um, also, we need to do supervi unsupervised reinforcement, all that stuff. I have done one tiny little piece of work to show that k nearest neighbors can uh, win against Python, um, but I, I need your help. If you're watching this, I really hope that you will consider um, actually trying to, to, to contribute in some way. Please, I need your help. Um, and don't be surprised if the machine actually starts learning at some point, like the surprise Pikachu here. Um, the lady yelling at the cat or dog, uh, thank you so much. Um, to my friends Al, Ivan, and Tommy, um, who helped me get oriented and work on some of the original um, KNN algorithms. You should probably check out these um, websites, uh, procommunity.org, rpro.org. Um, thank you, thank you so much, if you're watching this, for supporting our work on patreon.com slash rpro. That goes towards MLPro, the compiler, all the other Pro projects that we're working on. Also, if you want to run this, please use this Docker command at the bottom and then just inside of the Docker run CPAN ML Perl and it will install the code for you. Um, and uh, 
Oh yeah, uh, tomorrow, Friday is our town, uh, Pearl Town Hall Day. Please check us out on the facebook.com slash groups slash Pearl Programmers. We will be going live about three o'clock-ish tomorrow, uh, Texas time, for our recap of day three and overall overview of the Pearl Conference 2021. So I've run out of time. Thank you so much. Uh, let's not allow Python to remain the sword with us as the fork. Let's try and swap this around. We're going to have to implement a whole bunch of stuff from scratch. But since when have we let that stop us? Until then, I am again your fearless leader of Austin, Texas, Pearlmongers, Will the Chill, signing off. Thank you all for joining us. <laughs>